And so let me start uh, and describe a little bit about what my institute does in the area of water and conflict. Uh, the Pacific Institute is a nonprofit research and policy group in California. Uh, we address global freshwater issues, both problems and solutions. Uh, we collect data on water and conflict, looking at uh, the history of water and conflict. Uh, we try and integrate that data. We try and look at innovative visualizations of water conflicts around the world. Um, we explore case studies of how water and conflict are related. Uh, we look at the causality, we look at trends, we look at the multi multiplicity of factors that are connected to water and violence around the world. Um, we look at the theory, what causes water conflicts. Uh, but in particular, we also look at, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, strategies for the ultimate objective, which is how do we reduce the risk of violence associated with freshwater resources. Uh, some some context and some terms for this. The definition of what security means varies. Security means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different places. Uh, that it has expanded enormously from what was traditionally thought of in the United States as international security issues during the Cold War, in part because of the winding down at the time of the Cold War, uh, and also in part because of the expansion of our understanding of, for example, what the role of natural resources was in influencing tensions uh, between nations, between alliances, and uh, uh, at the subnational level as well. I would argue, and I'll show you, there's a long history of conflict over water resources, a, con a history that actually goes back almost 4,000 years, ironically enough, to the ancient Middle East to Mesopotamia. Uh, those conflicts take many different forms, and I'll touch briefly on those forms as well. Um, I would also like to argue that the risks of water-related conflicts, and in fact, the trend of water-related conflicts, is growing uh, for a lot of different reasons, including, but not exclusively, over what I call peak water constraints, the fact that we are literally running into limits on our ability to extract more water from the natural system, from natural rivers, from lakes, from groundwater resources as well. And those peak water constraints are leading in part to water scarcity and tensions over access and control and allocation of water resources. And that those limits on water resources are having both direct and indirect impacts on the risk of conflict over water. So factors to consider in the Middle East, and I would argue factors to consider everywhere, not just in the Middle East, are things like population and demographics. Growing population puts more and more pressure on fixed water resources. But demographics also includes where people live, the difference between rural populations and urban populations and rural needs for water and urban needs for water are part of the population demographic question associated with access and availability and use of water resources. Economic trends, greater, greater economic growth puts more and more pressure in certain circumstances on fixed water resources. That's a factor to consider. Of course, in the Middle East, we have a whole combination of ethnic trends and political trends and religious trends that play a role in conflict with or without looking at water resources alone. Uh, obviously, the Middle East is a place where conflicts are, are uh, prevalent anyway, independent of resource issues, and I'm going to argue that resource issues are another factor that play a role in the region. And then there's the hydrology and the climate itself. Uh, hydrology in the sense of availability of water or the scarcity of water, uh, and I would argue the quality of water as well, which I haven't mentioned here. Management of water resources is a critical issue, not just how much water is available, but what we choose as societies to do with that water and how that water is managed and allocated and shared. Issues associated with extreme hydrology, extreme events, floods and droughts. Uh, obviously, the Middle East is an arid region by global standards, um, but like all regions, 
we see both extremes of droughts and shortages of water and as we've seen in the last week or so, extremes of floods uh, as well. And climate change. Uh, climate change is imposed on top of all of these things. Any assessment of conflicts over water that ignores climate change is ignoring a critical factor. Just as any assessment of conflicts over water that looks only at climate change is ignoring all of these other factors as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more in the panel, and I know that some of the other speakers will address the interrelationship among all of these factors. But all of these are connected to conflicts. Part of the work we do at the Pacific Institute uh, is related to this. Uh, we have put together for many, many years and maintained something called the water conflict chronology. Uh, it's available at worldwater.org. It's an open source database, I would argue the best database on the history of water-related conflicts going back, as I've mentioned, thousands of years. Uh, you can see there's a link to the uh, chronology of it. There's a map. This is an example of the water conflict chronology map. Each of these dots is an example of a conflict over water, violence associated with water, uh, deaths or injuries associated with water, riots associated with water in three different forms. Please understand I am not talking about water wars. Water wars, editors at newspaper love, newspapers love the idea of water wars. It's a very short, pithy headline. It, it's uh, alliterative, water wars. Uh, I, I'm not arguing that there are wars over water. I am arguing there is conflict over water. And that conflict in the way we analyze it at the Institute takes three forms. Water as a trigger of conflict, that is, water is scarce, I want your water. It's sort of the traditional way we tend to think about resources in conflict. And there are examples in the database of water as a trigger of violence or conflict. The second category is water as a weapon used during conflicts that may start for other reasons entirely. For for economic reasons, for political reasons, for reasons about land management or borders, for whatever reason, but where water is used as a weapon uh, or water systems are used as a weapon. And the third category is water or water systems used as targets during conflicts. Again, conflicts that may start for other reasons, uh, where water is a casualty of that conflict. And all three of these categories appear in the water conflict chronology that we've that we have online. And again, there are examples in every one of these categories around the world and in the Middle East. Uh, this is a graph that shows the number of conflicts in the database from 1930 up until uh, 2017. We're still doing the 2018 analysis, showing an increase in the number of events per year recorded in the database. Part of this can be recording problems, part of this can be data. We're better at collecting data on these things now than we were 50 years ago. But part of it, I also believe, is an increase in the actual number of violent events associated with water resources. Uh, this simply shows uh, the regional breakdown uh, by UN category and the, br and the greatest volume of number of conflicts is in Western Asia. It's a UN categ regional category which includes the Middle East. Uh, but again, there are conflicts over water from every region of the world. Uh, as I said at the beginning, part of our effort is really to understand the causes and the roots behind violence associated with water, but then to think about solutions. And I'm not going to talk about these much in detail, but we think there are technical solutions to these that involve improving the way we use water or thinking about new sources of water that can reduce tensions over water scarcity uh, that include wastewater reuse, stormwater capture, desalination where it's economically or, or technically appropriate. Um, those are technical uh, options for addressing tensions over water resources. There are economic uh, solutions to this that have to do with the pricing of water or the way we choose to subsidize water resources or certain kinds of agricultural practices uh, or developing markets for sharing water. There are economic approaches for addressing challenges associated with water issues broadly that are also relevant for reducing conflicts over water. Obviously, institutional management is critical. The way we manage water resources in the 20th century that, that brought us enormous benefits also had unintended consequences. And I argue more broadly, and I'm not going to talk about it right now, 
that we need to rethink the way we manage water for 21st century problems, not for 20th century problems. And that includes joint basin management when water crosses a border, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, both at the international level for internationally shared water resources, but at the subnational level as well, internally when conflicts over water are not transnational but are subnational, as more and more of these conflicts are. And there are, of course, a whole range of political issues, address demographic challenges associated with resource management, deal with effective and comprehensive joint agreements. Many of the international rivers around the world have no political agreements. There's an agreement on the Nile, which is shared by 10 nations, but that agreement is only signed by Egypt and the Sudan, not the other eight nations upstream of Egypt. We have an agreement in the United States between the US and Mexico. Great, so thank you. I'm going to make or try to make three main points today. The first is that we are living in a time of unprecedented change and climactic risk. The second point is that the risks that we're faced are globalized. So if you want to understand the risks to climate and security in the Middle East and North Africa, you have to understand the risks internationally. The third point is that we have, we're living in a time of unprecedented foresight capabilities. This combination of unprecedented risk and unprecedented foresight capabilities underlines what we call the responsibility to prepare. Um, so let's start with a little context. All of civilization developed within the comfort of a stable climate of the Holocene. We left that bubble the latter half of the last century. We're now facing a climate that we've never seen before as settled societies. Yes, as Peter just mentioned, there have been droughts and floods and heat waves throughout history, but never have humans lived during the present conditions of a rapidly changing climate. What this means is that we cannot base our policies and our understanding of the links between climate change and conflict and security solely on what has happened in the past. The past is no longer prologue. Essentially, we are now and will continue to be for the foreseeable future living in uncharted territory. So we've established what that means in, on an atmospheric level. Let's look at what it means uh, for the Middle East and North Africa. The Middle East, or the MENA region, is among, one of the most vulnerable in the world to climate impacts. We're going to see this in three main ways. The first is higher temperatures and heat waves. There are some studies that are showing that the region, parts of this region could become uninhabitable within the near future. The second major thing that we'll be seeing are more erratic rainfall, and that comes from the combination of, of temperature increases, where you'll see more droughts and floods, uh, similar to the ones that we're seeing right now in Iran. Um, this is also a problem for the infrastructure, which frankly just wasn't built for this level of drought or flood precipitation variability. The third major impact that we're going to see, and that we're already starting to see, is sea level rise. This is going to inundate coastal uh, infrastructure, the salt water is going to in, intrude into uh, our freshwater sources. Um, this is going to be a major problem in places like Alexandria, Egypt, where a half a meter of sea level rise could displace two million people. Also in the Nile Delta, it's traditionally low lying, um, but it's also where 30 to 40 percent of the agriculture is grown. And 40 per, or 30 percent of Egyptians work in the agriculture sector. Um, so that's just a little bit of, of what's in store. But to be clear, climate change by itself is not the risk. The risk arises from how these climactic impacts affect the basic systems that our civilization depends on, namely water and food. So again, you have sea level rise that infiltrates into fresh water systems, that affects irrigation, that affects livelihoods. So climate change, without good governance and mitigating factors to help absorb these shocks, increases the stress on the livelihoods of farmers, herders, and fishermen, and the price and availability of food in general. And these things can scale up to become higher order security implications from human and national security. So we'll look at two regional case studies. Um, in recent years, our research led us to study the effects of climate change on food and water, human security, and state fragility in Syria and Egypt. And while these two countries are not illustrative of the entire region, of course, they each have faced unique risks that make these lessons broadly applicable to the region. Namely, Syria has in the recent past tried to grow much of its own food, 
while Egypt has been much more heavily dependent on the global food market. This has made Syria vulnerable to climactic changes in the region, such as precipitation decline, and Egypt particularly vulnerable to climate changes outside the region. And just to reinforce, this is one of many factors. Um, so back in 2012, we were the first team to explore the intersection of climate change and the extreme drought in Syria from 2007 to 10, the internal displacement and the political unrest. This was quickly followed by a number of other researchers who bolstered our preliminary hypothesis and findings, including Peter Gleck. Um, so what has been shown in subsequent studies is that the droughts from 2007 to 10 were made two to three times more likely due to climate change. This extreme drought, it arrived on the heels of another already extreme drought that the country had not fully recovered from at the turn of the century. It also arrived into a very vulnerable scene. Syria produced more wheat and cotton than the other MENA regions. It was heavily subsidized. It was very water intensive endeavor. And this, along with widespread flood irrigation practices that can lose up to 60% of your water, desertification due to overgrazing, transboundary water sharing issues with Turkey, helped to completely collapse the water table. Climate change, again, acted as a threat multiplier. It exacerbated existing stresses and pushed livelihoods over the edge. So due to these factors, 75% most vulnerable farmers experienced total crop failure. 85% of livestock among pastoralists was lost in the Northeast. And this resulted, again, in combination with other factors in the region, socio-political economic factors, to displacement of 1.5 to 2 million people in the three years before the conflict began in Dara. Some of these people moved to the cities, placing strains on already strained urban populations. They were managing refugee flows from Iraq and Palestine and facing water problems of their own from the drought, but also due to crumbling water structures. So these dynamics increase both the likelihood of political unrest and the breadth of that unrest thus increasing the chances of conflict. And unlike other Arab countries during the time period, the rural unrest was much greater and the drought was a significant part of that picture. Now, another case study from the region was Egypt. It was also influenced by climate change, but in a very different way, namely due to its dependence on the global wheat market that was shocked by a series of droughts. Climate change outside of the region were therefore affected it significantly. First of all, Egypt was producing very little of its own food, particularly essential staples such as wheat. It was a net wheat importer. It was one of nine in the MENA nations, the top 10 most dependent on the global wheat market. Therefore, it depended heavily on the stability of the global wheat market. And when that fails, it depended on the success of subsidies regime that was not particularly efficient. And so this dependency was tested by climate-driven extreme weather events far outside the region. We call this the globalization of hazards. So first, a drought in 2010 in China linked to climate change and a heat wave in Russia in 2010 as well made 70 to 80% more likely due to climate change, according to two different studies. And the wheat harvests, they were devastated in China and Russia. China purchased a significant amount of wheat off the global market and Russia halted all wheat exports. This caused global wheat prices to spikes. The effects in Egypt were dramatic. In a number of areas, there's a 300% increase in the price of bread in 2010. This led to a number of bread protests and riots, particularly in the rural areas. Now this, very clearly, is not to say the political unrest in Egypt was caused by rising food prices. That's far too simple. However, the rise in bread prices helps to broaden the appeal of the country's spring beyond Tahrir Square and beyond urban areas in general. So those are two case studies. Now here's the thing. For the most part, these events caught the world leaders off guard. This chart um, down at the bottom shows uh, state fragility index in Syria. What you'll see is that up until the unrest, the data and the indices showed that it was stable until it wasn't. <laughs> and so also, you know, the Obama administration admitted themselves that they were caught off guard by this. They created a list of the countries most likely to uh, have unrest, and Syria was the bottom of the list. Um, but it's not that it wasn't on the news. <coughs> if you look at the, the map in the top, this is what caught our attention. We were reading all about Syria, but we weren't reading anything that was telling us why it was bright red in this map. Um, that was a decrease in precipitation, winter precipitation over time. 
Um, and it's not that this wasn't in the news either, because the UN, the FAO, they were writing about this, but it wasn't reaching the people who were making the decisions. Um, so why was it missed? In part, I believe it's because environmental risks were not being incorporated into our assessments of state stability, or environmental risks were considered as something that was manageable. We can take care of this, it's not a big deal. The other reason maybe it was missed is because it's really complicated. <laughs> Um, there's a tendency, this is um, from the, a documentary called The Age of Consequences. It's looking at the Syrian conflict and climate change and drought and unrest and mismanagement. And initially, there's a tendency to want to have this linear idea. There's a drought, and then you have conflict, and then you have war. But it's not that simple. Conflict is never that simple. In Syria, we know that the effects of climate change were exacerbated by a broad and complex range of existing vulnerabilities that contributed to the mass displacement of people, it made conflict more likely and more likely to endure. So in effect, climate change places pressures on complex matrix, as you see here. So for a lot of reasons, Syria and Egypt, the climate-related factors were missed by the security intelligence communities um, in the lead up to the Arab Spring. But um, some improvements have been made. There remains a lot more that can be done. Which brings me to my third point, which is a big take-home message and potentially the silver lining of, of climate and security. Um, and that's despite the unprecedented risks that we're facing with climate change. We have unprecedented foresight. This means we have more data, better predictive, predictive tools for climate change, state fragility, conflict scenario, and trend analysis. Climate change, specifically when being compared to other drivers of international security risk, can be modeled with a relatively high degree of certainty. So consider, for instance, that the first accurate climate change model from 1967 a half a century ago, so for the most part, the climate is changing as the model predicted. Strikingly, where we've had inaccuracies in terms of predicting climate changes, we've underestimated the rate and severity of those changes. So while significant uncertainties in predicting local scale climactic changes and ecological interactions remain, the existing projections from climate model paint a fairly clear picture of what the future holds for the global climate which provides a basis for governments and societies to plan accordingly. So the region faces unprecedented risks due to climate change, risks that increase the likelihood of conflict. But today, we also have unprecedented foresight. As I noted to the UN Security Council in 2017, many of these risks are coming with a much greater degree of certainty than we have in the past. And that underlines the responsibility to prepare. That preparation can't simply be technical or technological fixes. Yes, we need better and more efficient drip irrigation. We, maybe we need more desalination. Um, but we also need to think bigger about the critical challenge of government and governance in an age of unprecedented change. And that will take significant changes to many of our longstanding security institutions, including those at a national, regional, international levels. So if I leave you with one other thought, I would say we talk about climate change and national security and, and water, but really what we're talking about is governance. Thanks. So please. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, so so I, I would say I second everything I heard, but I insist on the fact that the major, I think, the major reason for the problems we are seeing and the unprecedented problems that we cannot address is their level of complexity. They are too complex to digest and understand, and that is why we all have our correct but incomplete narratives about the problem. So, so, so all these factors are there, and then the problem is that we cannot distinguish between drivers, causes, catalysts, triggers, and so on. Right, so so this this is a major issue. Uh, until a few years ago, I think uh, I I thought this is United States West in the 60s and and 70s, and and then we have so much um, the growing attention to the environment in, in in the region, and we should be able to solve the problem. Um, there are of course causes, as, as Peter said. I mean, the peak water concept is a very interesting one, and it's we can say peak environment, peak resources. Um, um, and I, I like to complement on the water side. I, I like to complement uh, with with uh, water bankruptcy. I mean, the the whole thing is that our our 
our demand and consumption is way more than our available water, which is shrinking. But also, on the other hand, the peak water has not reached. We are seeing an increase in, in water consumption in a country like Iran. And, and with floods, it's, it's even worse. It's, it's harder to, to convince people that we don't have enough water. I mean, the, the, if you look at social media in the last few days, people are talking about the water crisis ending or water bankruptcy ending. And, and that, you know, where are the folks, like, you know, kind of Trump's reaction to snow? Where are the for folks um, who are talking about a drought, you know? So um, uh, where is the drought and, and, and things like this? So, so reduction is thinking. We are used to linear things. Thinking. We are used to measurements. That's Kayla, you know, showed the one index showing that everything is in order and we are in a, in a, in a safe situation. Um, everyone is interested, policymakers, experts are interested in measurements, and these problems are too hard to measure. Um, the other thing is in, in a linear thinking paradigm, we, we you know, like to connect an impact or effect to a cause, uh, whereas everything here is, is, is a loop. Feedbacks. Everyone is talking about climate change effects on conflict. No one talking about conflict effects on climate change, or you know, you know, conflict effects on, on on security. I recently was in a meeting with with the Yemenis and and not the the right group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and, and and you know, so so they can't function because. There is a conflict. I mean, there is a conflict. I mean, and, and when you are in a conflict, why would you care about climate change? As a, that's a secondary concern. You have to have people uh, survive. That's another thing. The, con the, the countries in the region have a certain economic model. The social economy, political economy of the region is something that we miss when in a lot of um, studies when we talk about the problems in the region. If you look at, I mean, Iran is, is getting a lot of attention because it's, it's a politicized, you know, so the, the topic of Iran is, is politicized and environmental topic is politicized and I'm going to talk about that. But, but, but if you look at the rest of the region, they're not that different. Um, Syria, since the 60s, bad, bad management, bad practices, bad policies, and eventually you have triggers, drought, extreme events, which lead to something. Um, if you get lucky, then you get a flood and, and things would, would, you know, you get some extra time, buying extra time. That's how uh, I think the Middle Eastern are, are, are managing the environment. So it's, you know, just betting on what might happen next and gambling on the nature and, and, and see what, you know, so buying time. But the reality over there, in my opinion, and that's something I was trying to bring up to, the, you know, to also get attention to in, in the administration that Iran and the rest of the region are using their natural resources, including water, to provide jobs to the um, weakest <coughs> economic sector. The weakest economic um, sector, the, the people who are in that category, are normally gov government supporters. So it's very important to keep them happy. They are the ones who vote. They are the ones who have been traditionally supporters of the governments, and they're easy to manipulate, they're easy to you know, buy with subsidies and so on. If you have sanctions, if you have conflicts, if you have war with the world, then you become more natural resource dependent. So you use more oil, you use more you know, water, you, you want to become, so you have to, because your economy, you cannot diversify your economy, you cannot in get industrialized, you cannot move the pressure to another sector. You have like you know, 20, 30% of the population having a job in one sector, and if they lose their job, they would migrate. What is scarier to governments, water shortage or unemployment? To any government in the world, I think unemployment is way more scarier, you know, way scarier than environmental shortages, environmental problems. Environmental problems, the other thing about environmental issues is that rewards would not be immediate. Indeed, if you do a good thing for the environment, you get penalized by the voters in the short run. Even in, in dictatorships, <clears throat> rulers pay attention to an extent to what the public thinks. And, 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 and then, but then, but then the issue is that the public is so distracted, there are so many problems to deal with that, that environment becomes a secondary thing. Now, the other thing is, is this issue of 
being unhappy with governments, being and, and, and being mad and, uh, and, uh, at governments, and then have building these wrong narratives, be, building these incomplete narratives. So, so if you look at the Iran case, for example, you have one side of the, you know one gang which is talking about every problem is is being made even you know, on purpose sometimes by the government, so including all environmental problems. And then if you look at the other side, it's, oh, these are made by our enemies. They steal our clouds. They manipulate our weather. Um, they, they, and, and climate change is a gift. Who did climate change? The Westerners. We are suffering. And, and we, we cannot solve the problem. It's, it's there. And it's, it's something, you know, it's, it's given. We have to deal with it. So, so, so the complexity causes this sort of issue, uncertainty, of course, and, and you know, so we don't know how to deal with it, where to start, and 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 then if you want to, if you want, you know, the solutions you mentioned, if you want to reduce consumption, should you go after lifting the the subsidies, raising the prices, all of these things would be costly politically. Now, extreme events reduce the political cost of some of the ref some reforms. And we have seen a lot of things happening, but 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 then it's it's a, it's a complex issue, and and these countries need to diversify the economy. Now, if you look at Iran, then you can say, um, so there are things like you know you want to become food self-sufficient for a good reason. Food security is a big concern for all rulers in that part of the world for good reasons. Now, I don't want to argue why why are you fighting with the whole world. Right, but but they know they have they have energy sources that that was never a concern for them, but food was has been a concern for them, and and you can see you, you know we have the history of what happened to Saddam Hussein, we, we we saw recently what happened to Qatar, so this concern is a valid concern. Now how you address it is 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 something which, um, you know, is questionable. The, if you look at the the big leaders of the region. Um, you know, and, and, and the powerful ones, you know, Saudi Arabia, Libya, like, you know, Iranians, they had, even Syrians, they wanted to become food self-sufficient. Saudi Arabia became a wheat exporter at some point in their history. This is crazy. This is insane. Why? Because this is the only thing you don't have. And, and, and then, you know, you want to show it and say that the, the sky, sky's the limit. I can buy anything. This mentality has been here in the United States some years ago. Still, we have people in Washington who think this way, but, but, but we, you know, you've learned by, by making mistakes, and then your economy, the resilience of your economy has helped you shift problems to other sectors. You know, look what happened to the economy of California when they experienced a you know, serious drought, and then go and see what happens to the economies of the Middle East when there is a big event, because the economy is very water dependent. So peak water, how do you address that? How do you pass that? You need to decouple your economy from, from water. This is what Israel, to an extent, did successfully. Can you do that in the, in the current situation, current political climate? No. Would you care about environment as your first thing? No, because you have to, you have political issues, you have sanctions issues, you have like all these other problems, oil prices and so on. Now, now, Iran, we know Saudi Arabia, Libya, Syria, these, you know, Iraq, they have their own, they're in, 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 in one league. And then, but, but you look at uh, the new countries or, you know, so more, the more, I think, like, you know, re recently developed countries, so Emirates, United Arab Emirates, they weren't under sanctions. They, they had access to the best consultants in the world. And um, they had a lot of money. And, but yet they managed to, to develop all the problems of the uh, metropolitans, for example. Like, right? so, so they didn't want to learn from the mistakes. And those who mm -hmm. wanted to make money in the region didn't care about those problems. So you create cities which have air pollution, water, water, you know, insecurity issues, um, a lot of environmental damages, desalination, all the brine going in, into the Persian Gulf. And so, so, so all these problems are there. Despite the fact that this country is not under sanctions, they have a good international relationship and so on. And, and, and the same in, in other regions. So Iran is ahead of the curve in terms of problem production. And a lot of attention is being, you know, 
given to Iran problems, but the rest of the region are, are not any better, and some are indeed much worse in Iran because of you know, the Lake Rumia tragedy, I think. Uh, we had a turning point in, in our modern history, environmental history. Um, public awareness you know, increased, but, but not necessarily in a helpful way. People talk about water problems. People, everyone talks about water problems. But they talk about water problems and water shortage while they're washing the street with tap water. This means that you, 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 you talk about this problem as another problem which was created by the government. This narrative is right, but it's incomplete, right? And then you blame everything on, on you know, a certain group, on one president, on, on you know, the left or right. And then the situation gets politicized. Brian Hooks' uh, recent New Year message to Iran about the environment is full, you know, has a lot of misleading messages. Why was this message sent to, from Washington? Is this a helpful? What was the misleading message? Like, I mean, there are examples of, OK, so, so say, for example, this example of the Iranian regime has built 600 dams after the revolution, while Iran had only like, I don't know, 13 dams or 15 dams before the revolution. How is this, this help, a helpful message? What the, the case he's trying to make is that, you know, SEPA and IRGC wanted to take advantage of this, and all of this was done because of corruption, and, and you know, they damaged the country, and they know that this is damaging. But, but a lot of these dams had been planned before the revolution. Their location, and a, a lot of Iran's engineering projects their locations, their designs had been, you know, predetermined, if you, if you will. But, but now, the, the argument that, say, the government likes to make in every anniversary of the Islamic Republic is that we have built so many dams, we have built so many roads, we have built so many houses, this many villages have, have electricity right now. The question to ask is, who says that those things would have not existed if there was no revolution. Now you can ask the, you know, the opposite question also. Who says that there wouldn't have been dams if there was no revolution? So, so this, these are misleading things. You, you try to politicize a problem and then there are consequences. So, so we know that President Trump is, is denying climate change. He's leaving the Paris Agreement and, and his head of EPA is a controversial figure. Yet he's so obsessed with Iran's environmental problems. Why? <laughs> Why? My, P Pompeo talks about it. So, so this, they might think that they're, they're helping, but what they're doing indeed is, is getting people like myself and a lot of other uh, you know, activists or, or you know, environmental NGOs and so on, journalists and, and, and citizens into trouble. I'm not justifying what, the way Iran is reacting. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Iran, like the other countries in the region, get, get paranoid when they see there, is, there are political statements. So, so I was in interrogations, and interrogations, one of the questions I get is, the countries w which, which impose sanctions on our food and, and medicine are now so interested in our water and environment. Why? How can I justify it? I have no say in, in D.C. I'm not controlling the statements in, in D.C. And Theoretically, we do not sanction food and medicine. Theoretically, Theoretically. yes. Theoretically. But, 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 then, but then this is also a narrative that is being sold to the public over there. And, and then the, the statements which are coming out of D.C. Are, are not working in the right way, in a constructive way, because you're just putting people against the government and that, that space. Let, let, let me stop you for a second. I mean, we, we all know in terms of our current policy toward Iran that there are many issues that this administration is emphasizing with regard to Iran that it's not mentioning with regard to any other countries in the world. So, I mean, this, this double standard is something we're, we're quite used to. But I want to go back to the, to the whole panel and, and obviously the, you know, the, these are very complex issues, but some facts, as, as, as Caitlin has pointed out, I mean, we, we know what the trend lines are in terms of things like temperature. We are busting through even the, the temperature increases that were predicted before. And I just want to ask each of the panelists to give a sense of what these rising temperatures are going to mean. Uh, I was at an event with Caitlin earlier in the week, uh, and I mean, you know, asked about American military bases in the Middle East. You know, how will you fly planes uh, out of Qatar, out of Al Udaid Air Base in Qatar? 
when it is 130, you know, 125 degrees, 130 degrees. Um, I remember being in Basra 30 years ago in August. I don't think I've ever been so hot in my entire life. And now it is almost hot. It was almost hot enough in Basra last year to actually fry an egg on the pavement. Uh, I am told uh, it was it was almost 130 degrees in Basra last summer. So just the impact of these extraordinary high temperatures on uh, on infrastructure, on social stability. I mean, what will people do when it gets that hot? I mean, I think. Um, you mentioned our, our discussion on Monday, but also, you know, as, as you mentioned, the president and the EPA have said one thing about climate change, but one of the things we've also seen in the U.S. is that the former Secretary of Defense has said climate change is a, is a national security threat, and it requires a whole government response. And I think that that's incredibly important. It's not just something for the military to respond to, but it's something to do in coordination with our diplomacy and diplomatic arms as well. Um, but it's something, why does, why does the U.S. military care about, about climate change and risks? It cares, as you mentioned, because of the impacts it will have to the military mission in terms of uh, its infrastructure, its bases, its not being able to train. And that's true for the U.S. military. It's true for everybody around the world. It's also true for, frankly, our humanitarian assistance and disaster response capabilities. Um, the other reason is because climate change is a threat multiplier. The fact is it's changed as the military is the operating environment. It's also the peacekeeping environment. It's just we're seeing that climate change as we have increases in water stress, increases in food scarcity, and the inability or unwillingness of governments to prepare for this and inability to absorb these stresses that, um, frankly, increase state fragility. And so I think one of the, the points that was made was how do you address it is important. That's incredibly important. And what I would say is, one of the ways we need to address it is we need to climate-proof our security and peace policies. We need to prepare for the facts on the ground, the fact that it's changing. And we need to be able to do it in a way that addresses the complexity. It's not linear. Yeah. Um, it's, it's frankly, it's, it's into a, the very core of our lives because it's through water and food and energy. Um, so we, we need to get ready for this new reality. I, I was thinking also in terms of refugee flows. You talked about displacement. Uh, you know, there's certainly been a factor. I know in Iran, where where so many, uh, where the protests that began in December of 2017, a lot of them were in small provincial cities where farmers had come because they they didn't have the water to to cultivate land. Um, Maybe yeah. 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 But then I can have I, to comment on this. Can I make three quick comments um, sure. related to this and, and Kabe's comments? First of all, without a doubt, the food question is a critical one. 80% uh, of the water that's used worldwide goes to agriculture. In the Middle East, in California, it's 80% it's of the water that humans use goes to agriculture. And it's critical for growing food for us. And that's intertwined, as Kave said, with the politics of food dynamics in international markets. If we can't address, and, and jobs, uh, rural communities have to have and have long depended on agriculture. So that's a critical piece of the puzzle, one piece of the puzzle. and. The, the history of food embargoes and sanctions has not helped any of that. The perception that the 20 countries in the Middle East that we know don't have enough water internally to grow enough food for themselves, and yet are vulnerable often for different reasons to political pressure on food trade internationally, has got to be, got to be addressed. Part of that is how do we best spend the water we have? To, to support our rural communities, to grow the food we need, and yet how can we also remove the politics at the international level that make countries look internally and say, look, I've got to grow enough food for my own population even if I don't have the water or have to unsustainably use it. So that's one point. The second point Kaveh kept talking about, which I agree completely, is how complex, and I, and I talked about this and Caitlin talked about this, how complex all of these issues are all the intertwined factor, and, and it's extraordinarily difficult to know how to deal with such a multi-complex issue. But academics love to argue it's this is the main cause, or that's the main cause, or, or whatever, and I'm an academic too. So setting that aside, we're, we may never be able to answer this conflict was caused X percent by politics and Y percent by hydrology and climate change and, and Z percent by demographics. Academics will continue to argue about that. And I don't think that's the issue. 
I would like to argue that independent of our ability to answer that question, what percentage some conflict is caused by, we can move toward more sustainable water management and that that will help reduce the risk of conflict over water. And I tried to make that point in my talk. And the third quick observation is <laughs> the, the president, our president's EPA head last week acknowledged sort of that climate change was an issue and made the statement, water is much more important than climate change. Now look, I'm a hydrologist and a climatologist by training. I was delighted to hear our EPA head say, we really need to address the water issues and I hope that they move in that direction. But I'd like to make the simple point that we can do more than one thing at a time. It's not, let's ignore the climate problem because water's important more important, whether or not that's true. It's that we have to deal with our water problems and we have to deal with our climate problems. It's not either or. And, and the idea that this is a single, any of these issues are a single problem, I think you're getting the message from all of us that none of us believe that and we can do more, more than one thing at once and we have to do more than one thing at once. Kavi, can I ask about water management in, in, in Iran? Can, um, can I? Yes, go ahead. You know, so you it's a, to that. Yeah, so, so, you know, just, again, you know, a great point. Uh, again, policymakers, a lot of economists, like, are used to prioritizing things. They're used to this question of if there is one thing that you want to solve, what, you know, right. or invest in, what it's is that? It's only markets. It's right? only technology. It's yeah. only yeah. something. And, and then even the public likes to ask that question. And then you get into this game of water is important. I remember I, I started working on you know, waste, and this was part of the education program in a certain season for, during three months. A lot of people in the opposition were attacking me, saying, oh, Kava Madani has lobbied with Iran's IRGC to distract people from water as the main problem of Iran and, and you know, get, get, in, you know, get them busy with waste. Waste is a serious issue in, in the Middle East. No one talks about it. Biodiversity loss is a serious issue in, in, in the Middle East, but people like to talk about water. You know, politics of water is great, transboundary issues, power hegemony and all that. So water is something which gets attention. Now, the, me the false information getting out of media, December 2017, Iran's demonstrations being tied to water by an article in, in the New York Times. The lady who wrote that article contacted me to, to interview. And, and then we did a few back and forth, and I, I felt like she, I, I felt she doesn't want to read any of the stuff which is out there. I kept sending resources, and the, from the questions I could tell it. So I didn't respond to any question. The article comes out, I get cited, but with the wrong title. So she didn't even know I was not a professor anymore. Uh, even my boss, the vice president, was also quoted uh, you know, with the wrong title. And then December 2017 is a wet season. People don't go out on demonstrations for water, okay. right? But this, this, this has been established. Now, consequence. Here there are questions from you know, me. The security community gets so interested on the impact of water, on uh, the uprising and opposition. Back home, I get interrogation questions. Would there be a water war? Would there be a water war? And I see it, I mean, I'm being seen as an agent of, so, so ethics. And, and this whole issue of like, you know, using any opportunity to link things with each other and, and create a catchy title and it's, you know, funny narrative is, 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 is bad. And, and then it creates problems. Complex problems need portfolio solutions, a set of solutions. There are multiple. So you're dealing with, a, you know, a, a sick body which has, you know, problems in its heart brain, <laughs> kidneys, everything. You cannot say like, you know, let me work on this. And a lot of problems in the water sector are byproducts of problems in other sectors. And that's something we don't, we don't get. And a lot of times it's, it's not within our authority. No one, you know, so people in charge of water and environment in Iran don't decide about food policies, don't decide about development policies, don't decide about population growth policies, don't decide about political relationships of the country, international relations, um, nuclear plan, and so on. So a lot of problems are, are byproducts which happen in, in this area. So this is important Forgive too. Forgive me, but I am going to ask you a water question. And that is, we were, we were talking earlier about, um, about the 
paving over of natural floodplains. This is something we've seen repeatedly in, in, in our country. We saw it in Houston. We've seen it in the upper Midwest where we've had terrible floods. You mentioned Dubai, uh, United Arab Emirates, where God knows anything that could be built on is, has been built on and more. Um, in, in Iran in particular, the growth of the population in cities like Tehran has led to this. And if you could just address that and then also the, the type of agriculture that's practiced. Uh, David Leyland, in his paper, he, he referenced this, that there is still uh, flood uh, you know, irrigation in, in places, which seems insane. So just a brief word on that, and then we're going to move to the audience. Flood irrigation is, is good for, for recharge. And <laughs> unfortunately, people are now, the government is after irrigation efficiency increase without having any plan for controlling extra use, and that, that's another paradox. So we will see increase in, in water use in Iran. Now, the issue of food security is an argument. I mean, not, not that this, this is the, the, the eventual, you know, the, the consequence for sure, but from the plans on the ground, um, this would be one of, the, one of the problems. So no one is planning to, to cut on water use, and th this is not a priority for the government and those who decide about. So Minister of Agriculture is, into the, is the one who, which is increasing in irrigation efficiency increase in Iran. Um, so so, so one thing, um, and, and flood irrigation, you know, so flood irrigation causes a lot of evaporation. But uh, so, so um, that's one thing. But on, on the issue of food security, food security is, as, as I said, is, is a cover. It's, it's something that, like, people don't talk about job, job creation, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, the, the production in the Middle East, what they produce with their water, you, you know, so you get crazy. Iran produces a lot of summer crops and exports a lot of cheap summer crops to, to other countries. It works for, for the farmers. It's market cash mm -hmm. income, but it doesn't help the country strategically because it's not cereal production. Right? So, so that, that, this is also an important thing to consider. Now back to the population game. Iran's, pop, if, if you look at the region, urbanization is, is a major issue. Population increase has been a major issue. Um, still the government, you know, government of Iran is very interested in, in population increase because they think that we don't have a backup population for, backup, backup generation for this, you know, the, my generation. Um, so, so 30%, the, 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 the urban population was 30% in 1979, now it's 70%. Uh, sure. Not that s cities are bad, but, but the problem in, in that part of the world is everyone gets caught, it like goes to just a few major cities. So you have these huge metropolitans, but you don't have small cities, you don't have middle-sized cities. And these big cities, you know, extract all the resources and they, they get, um, you know, every, now, this mentality of this perception of development in the region, which is, you know, the, the governments uh, in the developing world still get proud with concrete and steel. That's what you can take photographs with. Um, China, Iran, Brazil, like, you know, Saudi Arabia, Emirates and all that. So, so, so these countries are celebrating this sort of structural development. And in structural development, what you do is, is you know, you destroy the nature to build good things that people like, big buildings, skyscrapers, uh, towers, and, and dams, and so on. In the short run, construction is another thing which creates a lot of jobs and happiness. Construction creates a lot of opportunities. So yes, uh, there are a lot of populists who, who build these dams just to create, to make people happy and get reelected. That's corruption, and, and that's not right. But then, you know, understand the e economic dimensions of it. Now, in case of uh, the flood, it's too early to judge, but so far the anal analysis that we have been lo looking at, in a lot of places, the issue is that in, in downstream, you have developed things, there was, a, uh, there was an upstream action, dam building and so on, people lose their, you know, the memory of this was a floodplain, this was a yeah. valley where, where water was passing through, and then there is, there is not even a big flood, and then people get, get surprised. Now, the best thing is to say, it's climate change. <laughs> this is the new reality. This is the new normal. We're going to, so, and then what's the conclusion? <clears throat> climate change. What is the conclusion? Believe it or not, today, the, the president said it yesterday, 
Um, the deputy minister of uh, water and energy, or you know, said it. We are going to build more dams. These dams prevented more damages. No one talks about the dynamics of development below a dam. No one talks about the safe development paradox, a well-known you know, argument. So, so this, these are the things. So the social dimension is, is really huge. The political dimension is huge. And everyone just tries to take, take advantage of the opportunity to promote their agenda. And this is crazy. Caitlin, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to tie together a lot of what we're hearing. Frankly, um, the question that, that you brought up, too, as well, between ranking and such, we get that question all the time. How does climate change compare to other national security risks? And what I would say is, you know, frankly, we need to be asking better questions, not how does climate change rank? What does climate change mean for the geopolitical situation in the Arctic and U.S. relations with Russia and China? What does climate change mean for a drought situation and food security in North Korea? Could that scale up into another situation? What does climate change mean for fish stocks in the South China Sea as they move northward and for our relationship in the South China Sea? Um, so the other reason it's more important, it's incredibly important that we ask good questions is because our questions drive our policy. As we saw in Syria, we weren't asking if a drought or millions of people internally displaced meant anything for state fragility. So maybe we missed it. There were a lot of other factors for why we missed it, but if we're not asking these policies, um, then we're frankly unprepared. The other thing is, is you know, this point about people using climate change as an excuse. That's also not new. We've seen that. Al-Bashir has used that example in the past. Mugabe has used that example in the past. When people uh, are in a tough position, and they have a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of blame that you want to place on anybody but you. Sure. Um, but that doesn't change the facts on the ground. It also doesn't change that this is something that we're going to continue to see. This, climate changes are locked in. There's going to always be an excuse for an authoritarian response. And that's why I would also bring it back to the response to prepare. We can see a lot of these risks coming. We can't necessarily tell what the politics are going to be. We know the seas are rising. We know droughts and floods are going to become more frequent. We know there might be help. We know that people are going to have to move out of harm's way, potentially at vast scales. Yeah. And so we need to use this time and the information that we have now to put in place policies that are humanitarian. Because if we don't act, we're going to get caught flat-footed, and you're going to open up the opportunity for more authoritarian responses. And so I would say, again, it all comes back to let's ask better questions so we get better policy, so we prepare. Yeah. It entirely helps if you actually pay attention to facts <laughs> and don't yeah, try to relitigate yeah. them. You, you wanted to say yeah, just a quick comment. I, I don't think it's inappropriate that the government of Iran today talk about the role of climate change. I think Kabe's point is that that if you talk about climate change as the only factor mm -hmm. that's be, that's causing your current crises, you're missing the point. You're missing an opportunity to understand the role that it's playing. But more importantly, you're missing the opportunity to do things differently to change the way you do downstream flood management, to change the way you think about big dams versus alternative sources of water or demand management for water. That, that's the issue. It's not don't talk about climate change. It's that don't talk only about climate change or don't only talk about existing infrastructure or economics. And again, we're, we're, we've made that point. I think, or if you let's talk let's about it, take an action on it, right? Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> let's, let's, and let's, there's a Russian let's, state let's in Bush and Dilla more action, less talk. We have 20 we minutes left, and we have an eager audience full of experts. This gentleman here has had his hand up for a while, so let's start with him. Say your name and ask a question. Ken Dillon, CNN. Ken Dillon, CNN. CNN Press. What are the prospects for international collaboration, even between enemies, yeah. on environmental issues in the Middle East? Thank you so much for that question. Let me say that, that before the United States withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuclear deal, before Trump, we had a robust program of exchanges, academic exchanges, with Iran that included issues of water management, water use, among others, public health, seismology. Um, mm -hmm. And so what are, the, what are the prospects now, I guess? I mean, for this kind of uh, collaboration you know, between the United States and Iran, between the United States and any of the other countries in MENA? So, so two points about that. Uh, first of all, there are many, as I hinted a little bit in my talk, international agreements about sharing water. India and Pakistan signed an agreement on the Indus in 1960 
that governs to some degree their ongoing dispute about allocations. And that's, that treaty has held. Both sides have met their commitments so far. They don't always work, but that's one possibility, to negotiate international treaties over shared water resources. And there are many opportunities for that. Uh, the other point is one that Barbara just made. I was involved many years ago with the Pugwash Organization, uh, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996, I think it was, for their work to bring scientists from the Soviet Union and the United States together throughout the Cold War to talk about arms control agreements, to talk about scientific cooperation. It was a, it was a science to science exchange. And I've been involved in exchanges between the US National Academy of Sciences and the Iranian National Academy of Sciences over water issues bringing hydrologists from both sides to both countries to talk about water management, water policy at the international level, at the subnational level. And those agreements and those exchanges are incredibly positive for relationships. Now, in today's climate between the two countries, that's a challenge. But, but those kinds of opportunities, I think, are really important. Kelly, I don't know if you want to add. I mean, we, we have a horrible experience. Obviously, there are, there are environmentalists who are in prison in Iran right now for their contacts with outsiders. So is it, is it feasible to even talk about this in the current climate? I think we are the ones who make it feasible. It's, it's the th thing is that the intelligence community, security community, wants to control everything. Um, and if you back up and, and, and let them do that, they do that. Uh, they take over the environmental space because they have realized well, I mean, people, the intel community in Iran, intel community outside Iran, have realized well, and in the region, uh, that, that environment has the power to unite people regardless of their ideologies, ethnicities, and so on. Everyone was unhappy with the lake which dried up in Iran. We, we got international attention to it. Everyone is unhappy with Zoya Nerud dying. So, so, so th it doesn't matter if you support the government or not. So this, this power is, is what has made the environmental space vulnerable to politicization and securitization. So one, uh, you know, opposition of Iran inside Iran, opposition of the government inside Iran, opposition of the government outside the Iran, opposition of regime, the, the enemies and so on. Everyone understands this potential. So, so the environmental space has been politicized. Then it creates paranoia. The, the other party has reacted by, by you know, securitizing this environment. They think every NGO which is in touch with, with the outsiders has a plan, has an agenda. Kava Madani is, is too Western um, to, to be loyal to the country. So if he's talking about the environment, someone is paying you know, his money somewhere else. So I don't think, so it depends also on the enemy. What sort of enemy are we talking about, right? There are some regional, you know, forced regional cooperations. But normally those are, you know, environment is not the only subject. I think that's, that's one thing that we need to pay attention to. Um, you don't go and, and sign a treaty on water with your neighbor um, unless there is some sort of give and take, there is some sort of trade, right? Because if you're downstream and the up, you know, upstream country wants to give you more water, then it's, it's a zero-sum game, right? So who would do that? But in case of Iran and Afghanistan, for example, they're not enemies, right? But we have certain groups talking about things. Water is one of the topics. Six, you know, for example, I think six, six negotiating groups, and water is one group. So, so then if there is a bundle, then there are things. Nuclear agreement of Iran. When Iran was only insisting on the number of centrifuges, nothing was achieved. When they learn how to trade by Boeings and, and Airbuses for reduction in the number of centrifuges, both sides learn that this is a trade. So environment, unfortunately, is, is still a tr you know, part of the big package. David, you wanted to say something? Yeah, wait for the microphone here. Yeah. I should say also that Fatima Aman, who's with us, wrote an excellent piece on uh, the Iran-Afghanistan water disputes a couple of years ago. So Where there's another agreement. Yeah, where there's another agreement, which I believe uh, your father helped negotiate. Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> please. <laughs> My experience is, as an observer was long term in Iran. My father was involved in negotiations of the India-Pakistan treaty and also <laughs> between Iran and Afghanistan. Incidentally, those treaties were made possible because the World Bank, in effect, bribed the other party. Interesting. <laughs> with Iran and Afghanistan, the Afghans would never have agreed if they hadn't gotten from AID the Kajaki Dam. Interesting. I'm 
it was a privilege to listen to you all today, and, and I'm really privileged. I, the other day I was at the Wilson Center and listening to a lot of top government officials talking about the initiatives that the United States is making with respect to the world challenge. Will Rogers said, everybody's talking about the weather, but nobody's doing anything about it. And my background has been on the ground. And I'm wondering, there are things, and Colleen and I have talked about this, that the governments can do, not just in Iran, but throughout the Middle East, extension services to help farmers improve the flight ways of irrigation practices, crop selections. The, U, the United Nations agencies, FAO, UNDP, UN, they've had pilot projects, MENRA and so forth, with joint measures with the Department of the Environment in Iran, which have been very helpful as pilot. Unfortunately, the World Bank is not allowed to work in Iran because the United States has decided that. But what can be done to, uh, what is being done to have governments encouraged to train, maybe using clerics to help the local people to make small changes as a start? Let me add to that, what is the UN doing? Because as David mentioned, the US cannot allow the World Bank to make loans to Iran for environmental purposes because of our sanctions and because of congressional legislation. But UN, UNDP, I remember a very active uh, gentleman, Gary Lewis, who I met in Tehran, who was working on these issues. So if you could, what can we do in terms of these pilot projects and, and grassroots initiatives? I, I, one thing that's, that's incredibly important and speaks also to your question about like, peace and collaboration is data diplomacy. Hmm. Information is incredibly important now. And as we're seeing, we have these capabilities now to, to predict and analyze and prepare for these things. We are able to monitor groundwater levels from satellites in space. Um, and it also, I think, helps with, with governance. When you have facts, it helps sometimes. <laughs> so, but th those kind of things can help. And being able to localize that data um, is incredibly important. So, uh, and the, the UNDP is, is starting to do that as well. We have a, a program where it's, it's based on, frankly, providing data to local communities. Hmm. Well, let me add to that. I'm, I, I hate to be the optimist, sort of here, but in general, not quickly enough, I think we're moving in the right direction in water sustainability broadly. We're learning more about smart irrigation and smart urban water use. Kaveh's point that if you improve irrigation efficiency, but then simply use that same water to grow more food in an arid region, you may not be helping the problem, but we can grow more food with less water and then think about restoring groundwater and e protecting ecosystems or supporting urban communities. That, that's a policy question. There are all sorts of really innovative things going on in the water world, around the world, in terms of irrigation efficiency and growing more food with less water. Urban efficiency, storm water, capture and management when we get bad floods. Wastewater treatment and reuse. Singapore collects and treats and reuses their wastewater now. Israel does too. California is moving in that direction because wastewater used to be a liability, but now everybody's realizing it's an asset. We ought to put it to use. Um, uh, there are a lot of innovative things going on. Getting the right community to teach the right lesson is one of the things we've learned. Um, we, we learned a long time ago that smart thinking, well-meaning non-governmental organizations that go into Africa and drill a well for a community and then leave, and then the groundwater well breaks and the technology to fix it is in Germany somewhere, that doesn't help. But when the communities are involved, if it's the clerics in, in Iran or, or elsewhere in the Middle East or local, local women's groups, we've learned that the communities designing and developing the water systems that they need is a smarter way to go about it. And also, there are lots of new innovative financing tools, and this gets to the UN mm -hmm. question. There's what we call, now call green financing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really innovative financing tools to help us come up with the money to make the investments in the infrastructure we need that maybe move away from the traditional dam construction that the World Bank used to do mm -hmm. towards smaller scale projects. Uh, so I, I'm, I don't think we're moving fast enough, but I see lots of success stories out there that that could be lessons spread from one region to another. Rebuilding those matters, post-conflict, during conflict, what happens to them? This, this is something very important. We are all interested, most people are interested, I think, naturally, in macro solution. Micro solutions are hard to implement 
their time, you know, it takes a lot of time. But bottom-up approaches are very, very important. And this is something that we are missing. Can we contribute from here to there? Yes. The data issue that, that Caitlin mentioned is extremely important. And from personal experience, what we did with a lot of other researchers abroad with no connection to the government of Iran had a lot of impact on the narratives that they were selling, right? So, so now, like, you know, someone tweets and say the, the, the area of the Lake Rumi has increased by 40 percent. So, in, you know, within 24 hours, you can check the satellite data and see if they're right or wrong, right? One other thing is predicting and projection is one thing. Back, you know, looking at the past is another important thing. Again, we are very interested in, in the future, not much in the past. And we need data for the past. The problem of data and building a correct narrative about the problem in the Middle East is very important. And what happens here, if, if directed in the right way, all the resources and efforts can, can lead to a lot of things. I don't see a prospect of successful UN intervention or collaboration uh, with Iran on environmental problems. I don't see that at the moment because of the political climate. But yeah, I mean, some, some stuff can be done. You, you need some examples. But green investments, investments in, in the environment, because the inefficiency is super high in that region. Like energy saving is easy to be done in Iran and pays you back. There are a lot of schemes that you can make money off of. So these opportunities, are there and can be taken advantage of also, like for making money. You know, people like to make money. So go and make money of, of increasing efficiency and then green funds and, and new businesses, greenhouses in that part of the world. I mean, you can produce a lot with, with solar plants and, and export and make a lot of money. So there are a lot of opportunities. We're getting close to the end. So let me take uh, maybe the final questions uh, from this gentlemen and then from Faye and uh, is that it? Yeah, okay, so we'll do those two. Yeah. Um, starting over here. Wait for the microphone. Coming to you. Should we yes. do them both at once? Yeah, we'll, we'll do them both at once and, and we can have our, our final final thoughts there. Hi, uh, Michael Greco. Um, I'm the intern at the Center for National Interest. So uh, clearly uh, governments and states that are uh, embroiled in civil war or are a failed state will not be focusing on climate change as a primary issue. But have there been efforts or any sort of trials of removing water scarcity as a driver of conflict? I think you called it a conflict trigger, uh, so that it doesn't exacerbate the conflict. Okay, that's one. And then uh, if you want to hand the microphone over to Faye here in the front. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Maiden. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm Faye Moxeter. I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I saw on a uh, Persian BBC a, a documentary on a group of women NGOs who were in environmentalist activists, and they were run by an elderly woman, Mahlaba. I remember. Yeah. Uh, they were pretty instrumental, and I was very, very um, proud to see the woman at the forefront of this environmental crisis issue. Did you get a chance in your stay in Iran to talk to them? Because they do get occasionally uh, invited into, you know, uh, President Rouhani's gatherings, and they're pretty influential. How effective are these NGOs uh, over there? Thank you. We'll start with, we were talking, there's something like 850 environmental NGOs. So that was the number back then yeah. I was responsible to deal with the NGOs. 850 registered environmental NGOs in Iran. There are a lot of groups which are not registered, I and mean, also including some of the people you're referring to, a lot of active groups. They are pretty active on the ground. They are doing a lot. They need more training. They need, you know, good good projects, good ideas to implement. But they are very active. Women are very active in the environmental space. Um, so there are, as I said, a lot of good things. But but politicization of the environment, securitization by the government, affects these people. People don't know when they would get into trouble. So, so yes, there are a lot of good things happening. The reason that you hear so much about Iran's environmental problems, but not the neighbors, you know, neighboring countries, is the fact that Iranians are sensitive to the environment for, for any reason, right? But, and, and if you, you know, I've had meetings with people from United Arab Emirates, I keep referring to them, but, um, you know, no offense to anyone, but when you talk to the activists there, it's like golden. Every, I mean, we are building an island, environmental friendly island in the Persian Gulf. I mean, come on. Um, so, 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 so they're not there, right? So, so 
we are in a f different phase in Iran in terms of ac activism, but they need a lot of training. And again, that's another area that we can provide from here a lot of training, a lot of good, good stuff. And do stuff. it online, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll just go down the line. So Peter, your thoughts on, sure. on so, the other So um, if I understand what you're asking, um, because there are a lot of different factors that play into conflicts over water triggers, water is a trigger, water is a weapon, water is a casualty in the way we think about it. There are lots of different approaches to dealing with those challenges. And on the trigger side, when water is scarce and states are weak or governance is poor, you have growing tensions over who controls the water, who has access to water, who, how much water is allocated to different communities, rural to urban, farmer to farmer. That's where the risk of conflict grows. And so part of the solution would be find more water. That's the traditional approach. Let's find more water. Let's build another dam. Let's drill another groundwater well. And I, part of my argument is that in an era of peak water where you've tapped all the local water resources, that's less of an option. There are alternative sources of water, like treated wastewater or desalination. Or you think about the demand side. How can I do more with the water that I have? And that either frees up more water and reduces tensions, or it reduces allocation challenges. Or you think about politics and who has the right to use that water? What are the, the water laws? A lot of the conflicts in our chronology in recent years have been riots between two, two groups because they, group A feels we're not getting the water that group B is getting and it ought to be ours or we ought to get more of it. That's an allocation question. That's a political question. It's a water rights question. You have to deal with all of those possibilities depending on the circumstances. But I think that's possible to do, and it's tied up with this broader question of really moving toward a sustainable water system in its entirety. Caitlin, you get the last word. Well, just I would also point to Jeff Kent's work at, at this international interest. He does a great monograph looking at water and security in the Middle East. Um, but I would say, in a, you know, when we look at water and peace and security, it's not just water scarcity. Oftentimes, it's water variability, too much or too little. And I think that that's, I mean, you look at, we're talking about fresh water, but let's not forget the ocean and the fact that the Navy is very much a water-based thing. Um, so I would say, I don't know if we can entirely isolate um, water from, from conflict, but what we do need to do is be better at anticipating where we're likely to see water-related triggers. Um, we also need to just, frankly, climate-proof and water-proof our peace agreements. Um, so that we're prepared for a range of changes and we're resilient to this. Kevin, you said one last point. I mean, ju just, just to make sure that <clears throat> my message about Iran's water situation is clear. What, what, is hap what, what we are seeing in, in Iran today is the impact of decades of bad management and, and bad policy decisions, bad designs, a lot of unintended consequences. And they're not limited to, to the water sector. But, but we are not at this point seeing a, a sign, you know, a po any positive sign of a decision, a, you know, a major decision to reform this, you know, situation, to make policy uh, recommendations or reforms which would address the water and environmental problems in Iran. There are a lot of new exacerbators and, and, and triggers, but the, the, the problem we are having is that the issue of bad governance is important and is being overlooked.